audience is all having tea. Can we have them back inside? Yes, yes, we're going to make that. In the meantime, I think whoever is here, um, I think I should mention that we have four of, three of our four panelists are women. Jennifer is yet to be here and this often turns out to be, um, you know, something we struggle with. We, we start out when we think of, you know, having these panel discussions. We need to have more women, we need to have more women and the pool of women is so tiny that ends up being a man at the end of it. But I'm so glad that we have three women here. And I know, this is almost like you have to fight for a meal reservation now. <laughs> uh, let's get started. So, the conversation going beyond D2C, I think we've already gone beyond D2C for the last few years, right? I mean, if during 2020, 2021, possibly there was still a lot of conversation about online purchases. And like Vijay Shekhar Sharma was saying, um, the size of the market that's transacting online is tiny. And one crore was the number that Vishal had mentioned just now in the previous panel. With that number, Jennifer is here. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So, uh, Jennifer, I was just. Now that you're here, I was just mentioning to everybody in the audience that we have three of the four panelists here are women, so something to be proud about today. And we're talking about going B to C. And if I could start with you, you know, when I was doing research for this so, um, panel, I came across a very old story about Caraplane on EOI. This was about 10 years ago, and the headline for the story was the trick to save up save up to 40% on diamonds and this is of course aimed at consumers and then the story went on to read that you know consumers should consider buying diamonds on websites like Carrot Lane because these kind of companies can save on retail space, staff to manage it etc. So they said oh you should definitely go buy online even if it's a diamond and cut to 10 years later Caroline has opened its 200th store, 240th store, wow. So in, in 10 years, we've gone from online only to majorly offline, right? And so my question to you is, how do you balance reaching that larger audience now with your offline strategy? But giving them the same benefits of it being a need to see brand because that's what they're coming to you for. It's been built on that premise that if I go to Caribbean, it's going to be cheaper than somebody else that is an offline brand. So how do you balance this? Uh, first of all, sorry for joining late. I was stuck in the perimeter of Mumbai traffic. Um, it's a very interesting question actually and we get that a lot because we launched as India's first online only jewelry brand. But uh, at that time, the idea was to make jewelry affordable and accessible so that more people can buy diamonds in India. So the best way and the quickest way to do it was launch the brand online because the reach is unparalleled, right? like you said. And because we did not have offline stores, we could provide the jewelry at a lesser rate. And we did uh, offer it at 30% lesser than the market rates. But we soon realized that in a category like jewelry, uh, if you want to scale beyond a point, because the average price point that customers buy online is about 20,000. And if you want to increase that price point and you want people to try your jewelry before they buy, which is a very big lever while deciding on what jewelry they want to buy, you need to give them some touch and feel uh, offline. We started with some experience stores where we said that some of the jewelry will be displayed and you can come and continue to browse the catalog online and try a few pieces but that was a big fail because when customers walk into the store, they are expecting to see the jewelry, not sit in the store and browse online. So I think that's when we realized that if you want to take this business to, you know, we did about 2,200 crore last year. Uh, if you wanted to take it to that scale, you have to, uh, you know, explore the offline stores. Uh, but even though 90% of our transactions are happening offline, all the discovery is only online. 
So we first target the customer online, get them to browse and be enough invested and find the product they are looking for and then they walk into the store merely for the transaction in a sense. So all the discovery and the research happens online and offline is just a channel so we don't discriminate between a store or our try at home channel or our live the video uh, purchase channel or online. They can buy wherever they want but obviously the sales are happening uh, you know, more in the stores. So yes, now we may not claim that we are 40% cheaper but of course um, you know we moved on from that proposition to say that we are in the business of helping people express emotions and being available in 24 hours or being available close to the customers is part of that proposition. So that's how the brand has evolved in the last decade. Okay. Thank you. Deepthi, I can come to you now. You've worked with Edgewell in the past and now Sleepyhead. Uh, you have a variety of experience. I would like you to tell us a little about what is common to building a D2C brand like Sleepyhead that's now possibly going offline, you know, and with that also is coming a bit of diversification, etc., furniture, all of that. So, what are aspects that are common to building a D2C brand that's possibly going offline and an existing brand that already has a traditional um, retail model? Yeah. So, um, what I would say is that I think the core of D2C is innovation. Um, and if you have a unique product uh, which comes from either a stated need of the consumer, I have this need and therefore I want this product, or a latent need that you are able to uh, you know, mine and get a product there. Uh, CBA also started with mattress in a box. And that was a unique concept. It was COVID. People were not able to go to stores and get a mattress. So instead of delaying that purchase, they decided to get a mattress from through one of the marketplaces probably, and not even probably from the D2C side. Um, and once you get that mattress, you see the quality, then you go on the CBA website and then, uh, you know, discover other products that we said, whether it is furniture, home decor, and then you truly become a loyal customer or somebody who at least has to get in consideration set when making purchases in these categories. I think to that extent, um, capturing consumer behavior, capturing consumer need will remain constant whether you're selling B2C, B2C, B2B, and as I have said this before, it is eventually edge to edge, human to human. Um, so I think that definitely is like the common uh, thing. But what happens is that, like you said, I worked across companies like Universe, Stanley, Nokia, who were offline first. So even when we joined as a management trainee or a brand manager, we were given education or hand down, which was about behaving based on point of purchase. So how you behave in a hypermarket is different from how you behave in a family grocery store, is different from how you behave in a wholesale. Uh, and those were the different channels that we were taught about, right? And then came the whole wave of online. So I would definitely say there is a difference in attitude and how marketing is done fundamentally uh, when you're moving from offline to online because you're in your IDA mindset, you are still trying to build for the 70% of the business that is actually happening offline. So your marketing is attuned to deliver for that 70% of the business, which means that even if you're doing digital, eventually what you're trying to do is to make sure that your brand health scores of awareness, consideration, which come out quarterly are gonna hit those numbers. So that the 70% of the business that is sitting offline delivers its revenue numbers. That's what a brand manager would do. Um, anything that happens online is great. This is, you know, uh, the cherry on the cake. Versus a D2C person for whom the bread, the butter is the website sale, for them there is no time for IDA. When I run an ad, this has to convert, right? So I want all of the purchase cycle to happen within this ad. And therefore, you know, a meta or an Instagram becomes a lead channel where you're tapping onto impulse purchase or you're trying to create a demand and therefore deliver all in one ad. So I would say the mindset is very different. The way uh, creatives are developed are different. The media mix is different. Um, I think a D2C first brand is far more consumer centric. Whereas when we were at Unilever, we used to say we have to look out for the customer and the consumer. The customer for us was a retailer. 
because he's the one who will be selling the product to first. Eventually, he has to buy into our product for him to then sell it to the consumer, right? So it's not even as you deliver, you don't directly go to the consumer, right? So the customer or the partners or the trade partners for that matter have a, have a formidable role to play even in media choices. I can tell you now, some of the print that you do is not for the consumer, it's for the trade partner, it's for the customer. So you know that you know maybe this is not going to get consumer interest, but you want to tell the trade that you know we've got money, we've got muscle, we've got your back. You even include sometimes the names of the partners on the the bottom panel of the print. So every media has its own role to play, and I think, uh, yeah, those are the differences and the similarities to answer your question. Thank you. I think if I can come to you now, and um, I was reading that uh, Earthism now has a few kiosks in tier two, tier three markets, and the, the, the trend in the personal care category has been that Nika, and uh, some that you have funding from sugar have all gone offline. So what are some learnings that you've seen from these brands that have gone offline and something that you've applied to Earth Rhythm? So one thing that in fact um, uh, Kaushik of uh, Sugar had once told in, in, in an interview was that the kiosks are not as profitable as you would expect them to be. So what has your strategy been? How are your kiosks doing? What's your outcome? So uh, firstly, what you said is 100% correct. Uh, tier 2, tier 3 kiosks work better for us also. And that's traditionally because uh, in tier 2 and tier 3, you have aspirational consumers as against metros, where consumers are more, um, the access to product is much easier in metro cities and the ease of use and the, the education, the knowledge, everything is much higher in the metros. So when you go to tier two and tier three, the consumers become more aspirational and they want to, you know, somewhere match up to the metro standards. So that became easier for us to probably survive in an environment like a tier two and tier three and that uh, we opened about 14 kiosks span India. Uh, this year and out of these um, if I have to be brutally honest we shut down most of the metro kiosks uh, that's precisely because it's really expensive right for a for a small brand like Earth with them to go offline um, one we need uh, now coming back to the previous discussion also linking that to this uh, when you don't invest money in you know probably a brand face uh, or there is no brand recall going offline itself is a risky venture on its own, right? Um, so I think our learnings was that um, while tier two and tier three became profitable for us simply because the consumers were more aspirational, but in metro cities to get that kind of a pull or that, uh, you know, probably to make them, you know, probably become brand loyal or brand conscious, you need to spend a lot more money into brand marketing, where, you know, the brand recall is much higher. People understand the value behind the brand um, or the ethos that the brand stands for. So that's that was our major learning. Uh, but um, uh, through them on its own, on its journey right now, we're starting out to go offline. We're just taking tiny little baby steps. And kiosk was just for us to test the waters, to see how that, you know, probably even before putting money into brand marketing for us, we were trying to figure out and see today, what do consumers perceive Earth with the mass in the market? Um, are they willing to come and probably learn about the brand or test the brand or buy the brand? So what is that that they have on back of their mind was, what we were trying to do and our learning was to probably you know take some more uh, time in terms of you know spending that money to brand building brand recall you know right now i think we've been very strong in content marketing uh, we leverage on you know um, the concept of building um, realism with consumers where we talk about uh, the, the the brand, the ethos through probably telling real, realistic stories. For example, my own story as a homemaker, uh, being a seven-year homemaker and then starting a brand in itself was very inspirational to many consumers to probably figure out and say, hey, what's this brand all about, right? So that was the strategy that we started with, um, telling a lot of stories. Storytelling is one big, big aspect of, you know, um, digitalization, right? So storytelling became much easier. We were able to talk to consumers directly and tell them. So one example that went viral for us was 
Um, in the initial days of Earthism, when we started, um, you know, I'm talking about when we were still very, very tiny and, you know, we had like five, ten employees with us. I had hired um, some people with disabilities who are on the spectrum, autism and Down syndrome, to work with us to do labeling. Right? One consumer had ordered a product worth 500 rupees and the label was stuck a little bit data, like, you know, it was not aesthetically stuck. So she went, to, she went to social media, she clicked a picture and she said, I paid 500 bucks for this and look how the label was stuck. Right? Uh, we replied back to that customer with a video of this particular person actually spending time, money, energy. It took at least three minutes for that person to stick that label. While we apologized, we, you know, we made up to the customer, but we wanted to make the customer understand the value that she had created by supporting someone like this. I think those kind of stories connect much stronger in consumers' mind, and we started our journey with you know, storytelling. And I think still we are in that journey of going offline, so <laughs> that's about it. Well, I'll, I'll wait for that day to see your store on Kolawa Causeway sometime soon. Uh, Gaurav, I want to come to you as all these brands scale up, go offline. What are the kind of conversations that you are having or what are the kind of strategies, solutions you are possibly crafting for startups? They possibly don't have that kind of money that other brands that typically would work with Times Network would. So what are the kind of solutions you are crafting for startups with small budgets and going offline? Uh, well, uh, there's nothing called small budget to start with. You know, any budget that they try to use or they want to invest, you know, we find solutions that make it work for them. So as part of the Times group, uh, you know, we have uh, something called brand capital where we invest you know, pretty much uh, deeply with a uh, lot of startups, uh, upcoming entrepreneurs. And we tell them, you focus on what your expertise is in, which is creation of product, creation of a service, and let us take care of your marketing. Many of them buy into that because they also have to part with some kind of equity, and as you heard in the earlier session, many times, you know, uh, owners are not that, uh, you know, comfortable marketing the equity. But having said that, there have been cases of brands like, say, that, okay, uh, you know, which got sold out two years ago. Uh, they started the journey with us as a, as a very small trial advertiser. You know, the needs are very different for a startup brand when they just launch their service or product. You know, they want recognition, they want uh, to build a dealer franchise, they want some initial customer support, they want to go back to their investors and tell them we are on the right track, our product mix is fine. Those needs are very different in the first year these are this, how the needs change in the next two to three years. And then getting into fourth and fifth year, their needs are pretty different. So we as Times Network are able to provide solutions to uh, brands across their journey. In fact, uh, the next session that we have pretty much talks about this, we have run something called Brand Search, which actually works with startups and gives them a feel of uh, marketing and advertising and promotion that works for them at every stage. So I will let my next speaker talk about that. But yes, we have worked with closely with uh, 400 brands in the startup space in the last three to four years, where we have, you know, taken their understood their pain points, understood their needs, and designed solutions that really suit them. So right from uh, plain vanilla advertising, branding to content solutions, because many times these startup or these entrepreneurs come up with an idea which is very niche. And the idea itself may not have a large following. So then to promote the brand without building the need will not work for them. So we work uh, with them trying to create a need for that product or, or service and showing the importance of that. So that comes through content solutions. So we have uh, worked that out with, even with Thyroke, for example. Uh, during COVID, we worked with them on how uh, testing can be done better, efficiently, fast. In fact, they launched a special service that we collaborated with them where they were actually sending, uh, you know, vans to different locations and people could go and do the testing there because people are not allowed to travel from their homes. So they were sending their vans into different locations and we were supporting them and marketing on that and promoting that. So as their needs change and evolve, uh, we keep uh, partnering with them and keep creating that value for them. Also, most of the time, uh, the startup, uh, you know, enterprise, they want not only consumers to come on their uh, you know, uh, platforms or their services, they also want further round of investment. 
Right? So next round of investing, we also work with many of them on helping them create that kind of equity with the stakeholders. You know, for example, we have Meet Now, which is a uh, channel that talks to the investor community. So we do campaigns and we do content on that platform to influence the, uh, the community and create a positive vibe towards the brand. So it helps them you know, get the investor community engaged. We do several ground events with brands where they can also touch and feel consumers and get a sense of what the consumers feel or what they want to do with them. For example, we did a lot of work with a uh, mutual fund company where they wanted to target different kinds of uh, user groups. They wanted to target housewives. They wanted to target army jawans, you know, widows of jawans, stuff like that. So we help them target that at the ground level and create that need that, guys, it's is just not for the Experts, it's also for the Aam Aadmi. So we do a host of activities that allow these startups to you know, unlock the potential from a very small budget to a very you know, intense uh, plan that they want through the year. Jennifer, if I can come to you with um, changing your focus from <coughs> online to offline, how do you redistribute your ad spends, marketing budgets um, through the year? Are there new areas you focus on, um, work with brands like Times Network and all this content a big a part of your advertising strategy now? How do you look at it when you go offline? Right. So um, our marketing has definitely evolved over the years. So I wouldn't say that um, it's drastically changed channels. We are still digital first and majority of the revenue, uh, oh, sorry, the marketing budgets are in digital. But amongst digital, we've sort of diversified. Like, uh, you know, programmatic marketing was where we would spend the bulk of the amount. But uh, understanding that the brand needs to grow, we spend, we're spending a lot on influencer marketing. Uh, a lot of brand building is also happening, but it happens digitally. Because we feel that we still have a lot of headroom to reach out to customers who are digital first because the desired customer journey that I want is that the customer should come online, browse the designs and then walk into a store which becomes very difficult to track to offline media. Also the way we open our stores and we put merchandise in that store is also very scientific. So what we do is if I want to open my next store, we look at all our digital footprints and see that where we are already getting traffic from. Let's say I want to open my next store in Mumbai. We have about 17 stores now, so we look at all the 250 pin codes and we say, where is the traffic coming from and where we are not able to service that demand. So we know that we need to open the store there and that's how we take care of store profitability because before the store opens up, you know that there is a latent demand and then you, you maximize that demand by opening the store. Uh, and even the merchandise that's placed in that store is depending on what people are browsing online. So it's everything is very digitally stitched together. So when I'm browsing from a certain pin code, I see what is available in a store close to me. So the chances of me walking into that store are very high and hence the conversion at the stores is very high. So because of this reason, we prefer um, it's worked for us uh, the digital marketing route. Within digital, we are trying a lot of social media, new age uh, platforms like Quora, etc., where content is helping us, you know, drive sessions to the website. But yes, it's largely digital, specifically because, uh, you know, we want to track the consumer journey very, very thoroughly. Well, yeah. People, if I can come to you, the question I have for you is: with going offline. Is diversification, at least for brands like CBN, and we're actually seeing this in the mattress category, everybody from Wake Fit um, that started out with the mattress in a box um, format have all started doing furniture. So do you have to use that space for displaying more products, selling more products when you go offline? Because now you have a space and you need to uh, make that uh, ROI work for you, right? Thank you so much for that question. I would have uh, come to that anyway. Um, so before working at CPR, I was heading marketing for a medical brand called Dimension. And I have 
sat in both these discussions of opening your first store and finding out revenue per footage and you know how how many of my I, I, we always as a marketing and have a conversation with the sales guy who says how many of my products are going to get displayed I want everything from every category to get displayed in that store but I think there's a lot of maturity that has also come into D2C brands and saying that listen when you open an exclusive brand outlet it is a permanent holding that you're putting out and therefore it's a brand asset. So there's also a lot of maturity in terms of reducing density of products and making it more of an experience center than just with the objective of sales. Um, so I, I've seen that maturity even within the last one year, I would definitely say, because there are some stores where people are like, have you gone to that store? It's become a recreational activity because the store looks so good. I think a lot of stores are also looking at saying, which is an Instagrammable spot that I can have in the store. Because those get shared and you know you build your entire loyalty program around it, saying every time you come to the store you get 10 points. Uh, every time you snap a picture in the store and share it on social media, you get 10 more loyalty points. So there is a lot of need to make it an experience center, a hangout center, and not just worry about the immediate sales, but just say that listen, you gotta face in the heart of the consumer that will eventually give you returns, but right now you just have an experience center. Um, so that maturity is definitely happening, but I would definitely say that uh, eventually the sales team is not just going to let you have it, right? There is a huge capex that goes into creating a store. Um, stores get open literally as soon as they get closed. Um, so there are, uh, like um, Jenny said, that there are you know these indices that Google gives you, which is you know category development index, brand development index. You look at areas which have high category development index and your own brand development index is high, which basically means the category is also doing very well there and there's a lot of demand for your brand as well. And therefore, you might not necessarily be serving the entire audience through online because their preferred mode of purchase is offline, open store there. So there is a lot of science that now goes into saying where should you open the store. For example, another thumb rule is the distance between your two stores should be at least 10 kilometers. Because anybody in that radius will anyway come to the store. You don't of these. So I would say when you're going offline, there is definitely multi-brand outlets where you're looking at revenue, additional source of income. There is exclusive brand outlet which you're looking at extension of your brand personality as an experience center. But I think the one thing that none of us on this panel can walk away from is the reason to go offline is profitability. So I think I want to come to you last, uh, we have a few minutes left, is Jennifer and Kevin share some very specific interesting nuggets about their journey. What is one thing that you will possibly pick up from each of them that they have done with their brands going offline that you can apply to your young brand? <laughs> I think um, from what I understand, was um, Deepi comes from a very heavy offline driven uh, experience if I'm not wrong. Uh, and so as uh, Jennifer, sorry, I think both of them come from, uh, Jennifer is from a digital first brand, right? actually honestly I could relate to a lot more to what Jennifer was saying because, um, you know, even we go a lot through data, right? like how Jennifer was mentioning in the previous, uh, you know, when she was talking, that right? uh, wherever we had to open something or when we had to do anything, we would probably dig back into our customer data and see where is our customer sitting. But Jennifer, I'd like to say something that didn't work for us. And I'll tell you how also, when we were opening our kiosks, the first thing that we did was we took our customer data. We were figuring out to see which was our, you know, where is the traffic coming from? And it was on New Delhi. New Delhi is our number one, you know, city in terms of revenue that, you know, revenue is coming from. And we opened a kiosk in Sarek City Sarkate and we shut it down in three months because the rent, right? Exactly, expense. It was the most, you know, unprofitable uh, kiosk that we had because the rents were skyrocketing and we were not, like I told you, we, we did not spend enough on creating that awareness about the brand. And even all that we were actually, you know, we just wrote off that amount thinking that, okay, at least we created brand visibility in that, in that mall there. People who walked through actually saw all through them. So we just wrote off that expense, right? But I think my key day, takeaway from here is that um, spending a lot more time. So one more thing that I learned along the journey is, um, we were contemplating when we raised the last round of funding from NICA, 
Everybody around us said, Harini, you need to invest in a brand face. Come on, you're doing skincare, beauty, you don't have a brand face, how is it possible? We, I was contemplating, I was talking to a lot of my fellow, you know, entrepreneur friends, and one person gave me a valuable advice, which makes so much until today I believe in it, is you might spend a crore to get a brand face, but if you don't have 3x money to promote that brand face, don't spend this money. Right? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of young brands get into that mistake where they would have the money to properly get a brand face. I might get a brand face today and it's not for my 100 employees to see within the office. Right? I want 100 million people to see that face and for that I need that kind of budget to promote this brand face and that's when I need to invest that money there. So I think some key learnings like these are very valuable along the way. Um, sometimes you do invest, so for example, investing heavily on brand marketing at this point for us is not on our agenda simply because 99% of our revenues come from digital channels. So we rather spend more on, you know, uh, influencer marketing, uh, we speak partnership collaborations, you know, and stuff like that, cross-promotional collaborations. We spend a lot more money on these because that is where we see um, we, we create a lot of top of the funnel, you know, visibility at this point of time. And when we do top of the funnel, we know very well that the, the umbrella is really huge and we're reaching out to a large audience. And then we go to the middle of the funnel to see where, where are these consumers, you know, sitting right now. And then finally push them into the, you know, the bottom of the funnel where we try to, you know, convert them into, you know, getting them an order out of it. So, that's the approach that we have right now. And I think uh, my, my learnings from Neeti uh, specifically, would be uh, to probably, you know, um, look at creating experience. I mean, that is a very, very important point which even I felt was, you know, looking at it in a long-term perspective, right? Um, my kiosk experience was that the minute you open, you can't meet, you can't break even on the month number one, month number two. But unfortunately, the reality also is that small brands I work with do not have that luxury or that funds to wait for 12 months to actually get that benefit, right? We have limited funds. Uh, we need to break even in month two or month three. If we don't break even, then we need we are in that in that zone where we either shut it or what do we do next, right? So we can't burn that money. So that's where a lot of these things come from. So I think overall, um, I think journey of an entrepreneur is very different when it comes to marketing specifically, um, because when you know the previous session, I think one of them, I think he asked saying that you know, uh, investors like to invest in brands which are uh, more you know, cap capex intensive, that's complete myth. Uh, it's the other way around in fact, uh, investors like to invest in brands that have a very, very strong brand proposition out in the market than a capex intensive because capex intensive means you're spending a lot more money on building the product in itself which is not creating the brand in the market, right? So I think that's why we are currently you know, working on right now. So, we, do we expect to see a brand face in the next two, three years? At least not before the next one, right? Great. Super. Uh, the time is up and I think uh, learned a lot in the hurry, summed up a lot of it and did my job for me. So, thank you so much, Jennifer, Hari, Deepi. Just one Shana. point before you wind up, I know time's up, I would encourage one of the, you know, digital first marketers to also look at a combination of digital and traditional media and how it boosts your uh, you know, reputation in the market. Because through digital media it is not possible to get that brand value out. You can get transactions, but you know, your brand values never decrease. So basically use a combination of traditional media, TV and say digital, you are able to get best of both the worlds. So that's a, you know, maybe I'll catch up for coffee and try and post it them harder. But yeah, that is something which is many successful brands are doing it today. And look at policy bazaar. It gives you an ad on TV, threatens you. What will happen after your life? And then it converts you to the digital medium and sells you the policy online. Right? So many brands are able to navigate this well and extract maximum impact. Really, Harini, and you can have a couple of questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much.